Lost Hearts by M.R. James. It was, as far as I can ascertain, in September of the year 1811 that a post chase drew up before the door of Asbury Hall in the heart of Lincolnshire. The little boy, who was the only passenger in the chase, and who jumped out as soon as it had stopped, looked about him with the keenest curiosity during the short interval that elapsed between the ringing of the bell and the opening of the hall door. He saw a tall, square, red-brick house built in the reign of Anne. A stone-colored porch had been added in the purer classical style of 1790. The windows of the house were many, tall and narrow, with small panes and thick white woodwork. A pediment pierced with rounded window crowned the front. There were wings to the right and left, connected by curious glazed galleries, supported by colonnades with a central block. These wings plainly contained the stables and offices of the house. Each was surmounted by an ornamental cupola with a gilded vane. An evening light shone on the building, making the window panes glow like so many fires. Away from the hall in front stretched a flat park studded with oaks and fringed with firs, which stood out against the sky. The clock in the church tower buried in trees on the edge of the park, only its golden weather cock catching the light, was striking six, and the sound came gently beating down the wind. It was altogether a pleasant impression, though tinged with the sort of melancholy appropriate to an evening in early autumn that was conveyed to the mind of the boy who was standing in the porch waiting for the door to open to him. The post-chase had brought him from Warwickshire, where some six months before he had been left an orphan. Now, owing to the generous offer of his elderly cousin, Mr. Abney, he had come to live at Asbury. The offer was unexpected because all who knew anything about Mr. Abney looked upon him as a somewhat austere recluse, into whose steady-going household the advent of a small boy would import a new and, it seemed, incongruous element. The truth is that very little was known of Mr. Abney's pursuits or temper. The professor of Greek at Cambridge had been heard to say that no one knew more of the religious beliefs of the later pagans than did the owner of Asbury. Certainly his library contained all the then available books bearing on the mysteries of the Orphic poems, the worship of Mithras, and the Neoplatonists. The marble-paved hall stood a fine group of Mithras slaying a bull, which had been imported from the Levant at great expense by the owner. He had contributed a description of it to the Gentleman's Magazine, and he had written a remarkable series of articles in the critical museum on the superstitions of the Romans of the Lower Empire. He was looked upon in fine as a man wrapped up in his books, and it was a matter of great surprise among his neighbors that he should ever have heard of this orphan cousin, Stephen Elliot, much more that he should have volunteered to make him an inmate of Asbury Hall. Whatever may have been expected by his neighbors, it is certain that Mr. Abney, the tall, the thin, the austere, seemed inclined to give his young cousin a kindly reception. The moment the front door was opened, he darted out of his study, rubbing his hands with delight. How are you, my boy? How are you? How old are you? said he. That is, you are not too much tired, I hope, by your journey to eat your supper. No, thank you, sir, said Master Elliot. I am pretty well. That's a good lad, said Mr. Abney. And how old are you, my boy? It seemed a little odd that he should have asked the question in twice the first two minutes of their acquaintance. I'm twelve years old next birthday, sir, said Stephen. And when is your birthday, my dear boy? Eleventh of September, eh? That's well, that's very well. Nearly a year hence, isn't it? I like, ha, ha, I like to get these things down in my book. Sure it's twelve, certain? Yes, quite sure, sir. Well, well, take him to Mrs. Bunch's room, Parks, and let him have his tea, supper, whatever it is. 
Yes, sir, answered Mr. Parks, and conducted Stephen to the lower regions. Mrs. Bunch was the most comfortable and human person whom Stephen had as yet met at Asbury. She made him completely at home. They were great friends in a quarter of an hour, and great friends they remained. Mrs. Bunch had been born in the neighborhood some fifty-five years before the date of Stephen's arrival, and her residence at the hall was of twenty years' standing. Consequently, if anyone knew the ins and outs of the house and the district, Mrs. Bunch knew them, and she was by no means disinclined to communicate her information. Certainly there were plenty of things about the hall and the hall garden to which Stephen, who was of an adventurous and inquiring turn, was anxious to have explained to him. Who built the temple at the end of the lower walk? Who was the old man? His picture hung on the staircase, sitting at a table, with a skull under his hand. These and many other similar points were cleared up by the resources of Mrs. Bunch's powerful intellect. There were others, however, of which the explanations furnished were less satisfactory. One November evening, Stephen was sitting by the fire in the housekeeper's room, reflecting on his surroundings. Is Mr. Abney a good man, and will he go to heaven? he suddenly asked, with the peculiar confidence which children possess in the ability of their elders to settle these questions, the decision of which is believed to be reserved for other tribunals. Good! Bless the child, said Mrs. Bunch. Master's as kind of soul as ever I see. Didn't I never tell you of the little boy you took in out of the street, as you may say, this seven years back, and the little girl two years after I first come here? No, do tell me all about them, Mrs. Bunch. Now, this minute. Well, said Mrs. Bunch, the little girl I don't seem to recollect so much about. I know Master brought her back with him from his walk one day, and give orders to Mrs. Ellis, as was housekeeper then, as she should be took every care of, and... Well, said Mrs. Bunch, the little girl I don't seem to recollect so much about. I know Master brought her back with him from his walk one day, and give orders to Mrs. Ellis, as was his housekeeper then, as she should be took every care with, and the poor child hadn't no one belonging to her. She told me so her own self. And here she lived with us a matter of three weeks it might be, and then whether she were something of a gypsy in her blood or what not, but one morning she out of her bed afore any of us had opened an eye and neither track nor yet trace of her have I set eyes on since. Master was wonderful put about, and had all the ponds dragged, but it's my belief that she was had away by them gypsies, for there was singing round the house for as much as an hour the night she went, and Parks, he declares he heard them a-callin' in the woods all that afternoon. Dear, oh dear, a hard child she was, so silent in her ways and all, but I was wonderfully taken up with her, so domesticated she was, surprising. And what about the little boy, said Stephen. Oh, that poor boy, sighed Mrs. Bunch. You were a foreigner. Giovanni, he called himself. And he come a-tweaking his erdy-gurdy round and around the drive one winter day, and Master at him in that minute, and asked all about where he came from, and how old he was, and how he made his way, and... Where was his relatives, and all as kind as heart could wish? But it went the same way with him. They're a unruly lot, them foreign nations, I do suppose. And he was off one fine morning just the same as the girl. Why, he went, and what he done was our question for as much as a year after, for he never took his hurdy gurdy and there it lays on the shelf. The remainder of the evening was spent by Stephen in miscellaneous cross-examination of Mrs. Bunch and in efforts to extract a tune from the hurdy-gurdy. That night he had a curious dream. At the end of the passage at the top of the house in which his bedroom was situated, there was an old disused bathroom. It was kept locked, but the upper half of the door was glazed, and since the muslin curtains which used to hang there had long been gone, you could look in and see the lead-lined bath affixed to the wall on the right hand with its head towards the window.